My name is Mark Patterson. I'm a pediatric neurologist at the Mayo Clinic, and for the last 20 years or so, I've had a very strong interest in Neiman Pick disease type C. Neiman Pick disease type C is a lysosomal storage disease, and this is one of a family of 50 or 60 inherited diseases that cause uh, accumulation of large molecules, particularly fatty molecules, within the lysosomes, which are the recycling center of the cell. And depending on the exact defect in these diseases, uh, there are a number of clinical problems that result. In the case of Neiman Pick disease type C, uh, two different genes can be mutated to cause the disease, but in 95% of cases, the mutations are in the NPC1 gene. Now, despite many years of research, we still don't fully understand the function of this gene. Its product is not an enzyme, which is the case in most lysosomal storage diseases, but it's clearly very important in the trafficking, that is, the movement of large molecules within the cell. And when this gene is mutated and its protein malfunctions, there is an accumulation of many molecules. In the peripheral tissues, most of this is cholesterol in the form of free cholesterol. In the brain, it seems that although cholesterol also accumulates, complicated compounds called glycosphingolipids, that is basically sugar and fat molecules, accumulate to considerable excess. The result of this is that there is progressive deterioration of function of the nervous system. Now there are few children who first present as infants who have severe liver disease, sometimes with lung involvement, and often in those cases the disease can be fatal in infancy. However, about half of the children who have this will subsequently recover and may even function normally until later in childhood or even in adolescence or adulthood develop symptoms of Neiman Pick disease type C. And these principally involve impairment of balance so that they have a progressive difficulty walking which is known as cerebellar ataxia. Dysfunction of the cerebellum also causes progressive difficulty with speech so that people have progressively slurred speech and eventually become unintelligible. And in addition, swallowing is impaired and ultimately many affected people will require a feeding tube to maintain their nutrition. Now going along with this is impairment of cognitive or intellectual abilities so these individuals actually have a progressive dementia. Sometimes people have used the term childhood Alzheimer disease. Uh, there are some pathological features in common but I think the more important point to understand is that this is a progressive dementia. That is a disorder that produces progressive loss of intellectual function. Now about half of patients with this disease will experience seizures. About a quarter will have a very unusual syndrome called gelastic cataplexy. Cataplexy describes a sudden loss of muscle tone which may be as simple as a head drop or a feeling of rubberiness in the legs to complete collapse to the ground. It's called gelastic cataplexy because the Latin term gelastic refers to laughter. And so these episodes are actually provoked by something that the child or adult perceives as humorous. Fortunately, like seizures, this is one of the manifestations of Neiman Pick disease type C for which we do have effective drug treatment. Now one of the classic findings in Neiman Pick disease type C that's often missed, but which is a very important sign to make the diagnosis of the disease, is called vertical supranuclear gaze palsy. And what this refers to is a loss of the voluntary ability to rapidly move the eyes up and down. And in many cases, this is the first neurologic sign of this disease. It may be subtle at first. Sometimes people can appreciate that their children are jerking their head up and down, blinking their eyes and making a movement to thrust, and thereby use a different pathway to stimulate movement of the eyes. Eventually, these voluntary vertical eye movements are completely lost and ultimately the horizontal eye movements are affected as well. So this is really a devastating progressive disease. As I mentioned earlier, it can come on from uh, the earliest uh, hours of childhood, but in some cases the onset is delayed until the 40s or 50s. The oldest patient I've diagnosed with this disease was 65, and so it can affect uh, people at any age. The disease does seem to be rare, the best calculation we have of its incidence is about 1 in 130,000, but nevertheless there are uh, several hundreds of patients known in North America and Europe and elsewhere in the world. Making the diagnosis is difficult, 
because there's no simple blood or urine test that can be performed. Similarly, MRI scans of the head are normal until late in the course of the illness. Diagnosis requires that a physician seeing a child or adult who has appropriate symptoms should suspect the diagnosis and then, with our current technology, it's necessary to perform a skin biopsy and then submit that to one of the few laboratories in the United States, including ours at Mayo, that can perform the appropriate biochemical tests. In addition to that, I think it's always advisable to send a portion of the skin for examination under the electron microscope because this may show very characteristic inclusions in cells that can help us confidently make the diagnosis in combination with the biochemical information. When we have a secure diagnosis, we can then go on and look for mutations in either the NPC1 or NPC2 genes. Now this is quite a difficult task because this is a very large gene. There are now almost 260 mutations described in the NPC1 gene and a couple of dozen in the NPC2 gene. And there are still patients who are studied in our laboratory at Mayo Clinic and in other laboratories in whom we cannot find one of the mutations and that may be as many as 10 to 15 percent of patients. And the reason for this remains unclear but it's uh, an area that's being very thoroughly investigated at the moment. Now this is a very depressing story so far but I do want to give some positive news and that is that uh, a treatment trial is currently underway in which, in which I'm a co-principal investigator that's shown some promising results. This involves a treatment in which we inhibit the synthesis of the glycosphingolipids, the compounds that accumulate in the brain, and we have some promising data to suggest that this is helping at least some of the patients who are receiving the agent, which is called Meplustat. In addition to that, there's an enormous amount of work going on in many laboratories around the country studying the mice which have neiman pick disease type C and the cats that shown promise for a number of other compounds. And these include agents such as cyclodextrin, uh, which uh, probably alters the movement of cholesterol in the cell, although that's not certain. Curcumin, which is a component of turmeric, a spice that you're probably familiar with from curries, which has shown an ability to suppress inflammation in this disease, and in combination with meglustat in the effect of mice, is showing an improvement in lifespan and a delay in the onset of symptoms, and a number of other possibilities that are being actively investigated. So there is good news and I think hope for parents that more effective treatments will become available in the future. But I also want to emphasize the fact that in these children it's very important to have good general pediatric care. Many times children and adults who have rare diseases don't receive the best care because there's a tendency to attribute all of their symptoms and signs to the underlying illness. But children who have neiman pick disease type C still get ear infections, they still have gastroenteritis, they can have constipation when they're not mobile, and any of these uh, uh, coincident conditions can make their symptoms and signs worse and they're readily remediable by appropriate treatment. So I think addressing those issues is very important in all of these patients and I'm a very strong advocate for ensuring that the patient's general pediatrician or family practitioner is as knowledgeable as possible about the disease and certainly that's something that I'm always prepared to help with. We do have evidence to suggest the sooner children are recognized and treated, the more likely it is that we can get a better outcome to improve their quality of life and of course we hope prolong their life uh, as far as possible. Now at the moment we're investigating ways of uh, studying the clinical response to some of these agents in non-traditional approaches. Traditional clinical trials require large numbers of patients with controls and uh, uh, matched patients who will receive a treatment. That's very difficult to do in neiman pick disease type C because the disease is so rare. And so, as I mentioned, we're investigating novel approaches to the treatment of these diseases. The bottom line is this is a very serious disease, one which is not as well known or understood as we would wish it to be. But if one has to have neiman pick disease type C, this is the best time in history to have this disease. We have the promise of better understanding of this disease through basic research, which is accelerating at the moment, as well as a number of potential treatment options. Thank you for listening.